is October the 16th, 2009. My name is Karen Neuror and I'm a librarian for Oklahoma State University. I'm here at the Conoco Phillips Alumni Center with Mr. Glenn Cat Taylor. And Mr. Taylor is going to participate in an interview for O State Stories. It's an oral history project of the Oklahoma State University Library. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, for participating in our interviews today. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. How did you hear about the interview? Uh, just a few moments ago. Okay. <laughs> you were recruited. <laughs> I was recruited, yes. Okay. Well, welcome back to OSU for your 50-year class reunion. Are, are you a frequent visitor back at OSU? I'm an occasional visitor since uh, at the present time I don't live very far from here down in Big Perkins, Oklahoma. Home of Frank Eaton, Pistol Pete, right? Home of Frank Eaton, yes, and we're very proud people down there to be the home of uh, the original Pistol Pete Eaton, and we're also proud to have a, a traffic light in Perkins, Oklahoma. Right? That's wonderful. So we're so proud of that per traffic light. Good. Yeah. Did you grow up around Perkins? I grew up in the hills of eastern Oklahoma, in uh, in the Sequoia County, and uh, the capital of Sequoia County is Salisaw. And uh, I had the opportunity of going to high school in Salisaw and being a Salisaw Black Diamond. And it wasn't until I graduated from high school that I found out what a Black Diamond was. It, I found out it's not a watermelon or it's not a snake. I found out that it referred to the coal that was strip mined in that area of the country. So did you think it was a watermelon or snake when you were younger? You know, I was so naive, I really didn't even think about it, tell you the truth. <laughs> well, I know a lot about Salisaw, Oklahoma. Uh-oh. Uh, we lived at Poto for 21 years. You were a Poto pirate. Yes, yes, yes I taught at the high school there, and I was at the <laughs> junior college. And my son, uh, who came, both of my sons came to OSU, and my older son married a Salisaw girl, uh -huh. Libby Whedon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Her mother was a farmer, one of the farmer girls. Perry uh, Beth. Know the know the farmers very well. Okay. Yeah. Well, so it's a small world here. Salisaw is infamous for two major things. Uh, one is that we're the uh, Salisaw is a hometown of Pretty Boy Floyd, one of the ten most wanted back in the Dillinger days. And the author John Steinbeck made Salisaw rather famous as it was the supposedly the beginning of the Grapes of Wrath in his novel. Yes, and he, he didn't get that right, did he? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> he was a little too far east on that story. <laughs> well, that's some good country down there. Okay, so you're living at Perkins now. Well, um, I see from looking at your sheet here that you came to OSU, you were here from 57 to 59. Yes, I started my college endeavors at uh, a junior college in Warner, Oklahoma called Connors State College. And I went two years there. Uh, the college survived me for two years. <laughs> and then I came to Stillwater. In the first semester that it was OSU, I came in the fall of 1957. We became OSU instead of Oklahoma A&M at that time. Well, what made you decide to come to OSU? Oh, I just, I had come to OSU with 4-H events. I came to 4-H Roundup on campus, and so it just seemed like the natural thing to do being uh, interested in agriculture. What was your major when you were in the undergraduate program? In my undergraduate program, my major was animal husbandry. Now that dates you. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it has another title now, animal husbandry is not one of the names of that particular endeavor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And then you went on to get your master's degree here? Yes, I did. I, was, I went on to get my master's degree at OSU in the Department of Horticulture. Were there any particular classes or professors that stand out in your memory? Well, I guess uh, I was really enjoying those years, undergraduate years, and uh, I think I enjoyed uh, many of the other professors. They were nicer to me than they should have been for the kind of character that I was, and of course I guess I remember uh, Dr. Bob Tadashek, among those that, that took care of me, took care of me. Was it hard to get into graduate school at that time? Do you remember what kind of process you had to go through? Uh, I don't remember that it was uh, especially difficult. It must not have been. I got it. <laughs> so. um. Well, which buildings were your classes in? Most of my classes were in what is now Ag Hall mm -hmm. and the old Amal Husbandry building, which uh, is is no longer in place. Yeah. You're fine. How did you feel about when they took that building down? Well, I, uh, I, I'm. I lost a lot of memories there, even at the block and I was a member of the block and bridal club, and of course we had our block and bridal rodeo there each, and uh, plus all the classes that I had in there, some very good times. Did you have any classes in the Quonset huts? Were they still here? Yes, I did. I had uh, I had the, I remember the Quonset huts, and I remember taking some ag engineering classes in there. Yeah. Was that a good uh, learning environment? Well, uh, we survived. It got a little warm from time to time, as I remember. <laughs> well, so you came here right after the name changed, and um, Oklahoma State joined the Big Eight Conference. They became the Cowboys. They were the Aggies. Um, did you have any feeling about those changes, those kinds of changes that were going on? Uh, no, ma'am, I didn't. Okay. And you mentioned living in Perkins now. Well, when you were a student here, did you ever see Frank Eaton? Yes, I did. I remember uh, seeing uh, Frank Eaton uh, riding on a stagecoach in the homecoming parades. And he had his, his big hat and his long handlebar mustache, and uh, he had a he had a shotgun across his lap and he was riding on a stagecoach in the homecoming parades. Where did you live while you were going to school here? Well, when I, the first uh, year when I was in school, undergraduate school here, I lived with my older brother and his wife and two little girls up in Old Vet Village in the little cardboard like that village that used to be up the way and he was on the GI Bill uh -huh. and so uh, I was able to uh, scrape enough money for tuition and uh, and he let me stay with him that year with he and his family okay. and then uh, the second year he uh, he went uh, back to eastern Oklahoma and I uh, I lived out on North Washington. A uh, man and woman let me sleep upstairs in a very warm attic. <laughs> and I, to pay for that room, I took care of a bunch of chinchillas. Out in the little garage, they had it air conditioned and they grew chinchillas for their fur. And I had the chore of taking care of those chinchillas for my, for my room there. How many did they have? I cannot remember. We had we had a garage full of cages, though, that uh, oh. grew the chinchillas. And I remember cleaning after those chinchillas, and then I would take the <clears throat> I would take the cleanings, and I would take them down to the neighbor and put them on their garden. <clears throat> they wanted those cleanings, and 
And I also remember one night I decided I was going home with a bunch of boys the next morning. I'll go back to Salisaw. So I cleaned those cages at midnight or later. And I also remember taking the wheelbarrow down to the neighbors. And I also remember they called the law on me because they thought I was a prowler in the back, you know. And so I talked my way out of that. And <laughs> What activities were you involved in when you were a student here? <clears throat> well, I was a member of the uh, Block and Bridal Club. I remember going through initiation and carrying a paddle around and getting the signatures of all the members. And, uh, we, uh, th th those were very good times. I just really enjoyed the other members of that club. And, <clears throat> I guess one of them, uh, one of my activities that I spent most time of was uh, on the floor, fourth floor of the student union where we had jukeboxes. And uh, we uh, had places to dance on the fourth floor and uh, popular music back then, Ma Presley's boy Elvis had arrived on the scene and Jerry Lee Lewis, the killer, was there with a lot of good music and uh, there was just a lot of time spent there more time than there probably should have been there on the fourth floor of the student union. Yeah. Did you play any sports when you were a student here? I did not play sports as a, as a student here at OSU. When I was in junior college, I played some baseball for mm -hmm. Connors. What do you remember about homecoming? Well, I just remembered it was a big deal. Even uh, even back then, and uh, uh, I don't guess I have any special memories, but I just uh, I remember it was a good feeling always on campus. Everybody seemed to be upbeat, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Do you come back often for homecoming? You know, I don't uh, I don't participate a lot in the homecoming events, but yes, I do come back occasionally, especially for the walk around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Has that changed? It hasn't. It hasn't changed a lot to me. It's just, it, it's great. Mm -hmm. It's great. Well, how many students were in the block and bridal? Were, was it a group of male and female students? Yes, there were both, and you know, I'm just not sure of the number that was. That was was it a large group? group? It was a rather large group, mostly of animal husbandry majors mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, yeah. And you all put on a rodeo. We put on a rodeo and uh, had, a, had a very nice rodeo. And uh, after the rodeo, we always had uh, jackpot roping and bulldogging. And then the outsiders, uh, guys that uh, were not in school here and girls uh, would come and they might have a barrel racing. Uh, and then they would have steer wrestling and calf roping jackpots afterwards and it might go to two or three o'clock in the mornings before we would get those over with and members of the black and bridal worked those jackpots and worked the rodeo we brought the cattle along underneath in the animal science building uh, down in the basement area there was two wings where we brought the cattle back to the chutes at the front at the front end so it took quite a few members to work those events. Were, was this a fundraiser for the organization? Yes, a lot of it, uh, a lot of it was, mm -hmm. yes. Were there other activities and events that, that uh, were traditions for Block and Bridal? There were some related events that uh, were very common. One of them, we had Western Week everybody dressed western and uh, and it was just the western atmosphere all over campus and we would set up uh, on the campus uh, some big posts in the ground four big posts and suspended between those posts we uh, we had a barrel and a 55 gallon barrel 
And on that barrel, we put a, a search single, a riding rig, like bareback uh, bronc riders use. And then we would uh, allow the people coming across campus to to ride that buck and barrel. And we would make charge them so, so much to get on and maybe, you know, just for fun. Uh, we would have guys on the rope that make that barrel buck. And what was really interesting is that we would allow maybe some unlikely person ride that barrel, ride it to full eight seconds. And then we would catch some hero walking across campus with a girl on his arm. And we might entice him to show his prowess at riding the buck and barrel. And, and then you put four guys on that rope and that barrel would almost switch ends. There was no way a human being could, could stay on essentially. And uh, we could usually stick his head in the ground uh, from the buck and barrel. And it created a lot of excitement. <laughs> and also during Western week, uh, we would have music, Western music down in the uh, ballroom after the rodeo. And uh, one particular year we had Hank Thompson and the Brazos Valley Boys playing Western dance music down in the ballroom. And it was that year <clears throat> that I became associated with an event that happened the clown at the rodeo had a Burma bull that he had trained. And after the rodeo, going up to that dance <clears throat> in the student union, that bull was located in the elevator. And for some reason or another, I was associated with that event. Hmm. Uh, the bull was pretty docile. In fact, he was probably the most docile animal in the building of that evening, at least. And, but I learned a lot from that event, uh, from that activity. And uh, in case you're ever interested or, <clears throat> or you're going along a big building sometime and, and you find someone that's having trouble getting their bull on the elevator, uh, I might give you a few pointers. The first thing you do if you load a bull on the elevator, <clears throat> whether it's a student union or any other building, you take the lead rope and you get his attention. And then you must understand that you cannot lead a bull into a dark hole. So you don't lead the bull into the elevator forward. Instead, you t turn him around and put him in reverse. And you gently nudge on his shoulder and you cluck to him a little bit. Bully, 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 bully. Come on, bully. Come on, bully. And you back him into the elevator. And you put the rear end in one corner of the elevator. And you more or less drape the body of the bull around the elevator so that there's room for anybody who, who might want to ride the elevator with the bull. And uh, it works pretty well. You can load a bull pretty easy if you'll follow those pointers. And will the elevator go up and down with a bull in it? <laughs> <laughs> will it, does it, Hold can, this, you, can you reach the buttons to make it? <laughs> Move. <laughs> <clears throat> on this particular evening, the bull did not have the opportunity because the campus police showed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have added another level of excitement to that experience. Oh, it did. It very definitely did. <laughs> <laughs> and would you say that you had to miss the dance that night? with Hank Thompson because of that experience? I made the last part of it. <laughs> I, was, 
Okay. <laughs> that is quite a story. Did the clown know about what was going on with his <clears throat> bull? Uh, he was there. He was there. Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, I was going to ask you about personal and leadership growth. <laughs> I don't think that qualifies. Maybe we should skip that part. <laughs> and the next question is, what did you do for fun and entertainment? <laughs> so, <laughs> does anything else come to mind about that? <laughs> well... <laughs> I can tell you where the bull spent the night. <laughs> the, bull, the, bull, the bull spent the night in a in a barn down in the southern part of the of the town. Um. And I think one or two involved with the incident <clears throat> spent the night in the County Jail. I'm not sure. Oh, hmm. It was a serious incident then. A pretty serious incident, yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, do any other incidents stand out in your memory? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> were there any that were uh, there the opportunities little... for personal and leadership <laughs> growth? <laughs> Is this the way you intended for this interview to go? No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I remember... You do have some storytelling skills, though, I must say. I remember uh, eating at a boarding house my second year. The boarding house was located at the corner of Bennett Hall and, I, and uh, Gallagher Island. I believe that's a parking lot. Now, it was uh, that little intersection, it would have been the northwest corner. And I usually took one meal a day at that house, at that boarding house, and a lot of the other old farm boys that was in school here, we ate there at that boarding house. And I can re remember while we were waiting on the meal to be ready for that evening, uh, a very popular event uh, was going on in the hula hoop and we'd have guys with hula hoops some running two and three at a time standing out in the middle of the street and waiting on the meal you know it also became a popular thing that year to toss somebody in theta pond <clears throat> and uh, sooner or later it come it came everybody's time to be thrown into Theta Pond, usually. And I can remember a bunch of big old farm boys that ate there, and uh, and I went in that evening, one evening, and I just had the feeling that it was going to be my time. There was a bay window in that boarding house, and I had written with my roommate. His name was Arlo Dalrymple. I'd ridden in his pickup down to eat that evening. And he had his pickup parked outside that bay window. And I could just, I just felt it in the air that as soon as I got through eating that this gang was going to gang me. I finished as rapidly as I could and I made my way over to that bay window and I dived through it. And I jumped in the pickup, and I was going about to make a getaway, except for the smallest man there. And he stuck his foot in the door, and I couldn't get it shut, and they messed around and got the keys out. So they tied me up with a lariat rope and a picking string, <clears throat> and they tossed me on the shoulders of that mob, and we marched to Theta Pond. And I can remember the gang marched through Cordell Hall then was a residence hall. And they were hollering and a hooping and the crowd was a gathering to see what was going on. And I had my hands tied behind my back and my feet were tied and they were 
that I was on their shoulders. They were holding me up. We went through Cordell Hall. We turned south. We went down beside the library. And then we headed toward Theta Pond. And I remember getting to Theta Pond and I asked him, I says, before you throw me in Theta Pond, would you take my billfold out of my back pocket back there? I kind of hate to get everything wet. <clears throat> and they obliged me. They took my billfold out and they gave it to my roommate. My roommate had just bought him a brand new pair of boots. Oh, he's so proud of them. Got them out of El Paso. And my roommate was standing there and they let him hold my billfold. And they seesawed me back and forth. They untied me first and they threw me out into Theta Pond. But you know what? I beat my roommate back to shore. They threw him in further than they did me with my billfold, as I remember. You know, <laughs> that ended that evening. <laughs> And I believe that was the only time I was ever thrown in Theta Pond. <laughs> well, that's the best story I've heard about being thrown in Theta Pond. <laughs> Were there uh, any, you mentioned the hanging out in the student union. Uh, what about off campus places to hang out? You know, I never. Uh, I never I got off campus much, I'd have to admit. I was stayed on campus most of the time. Yeah. Um, what about dating, places to go, social social events, things like that? Yeah, dating uh, uh, dating was, uh, my courting was mostly done on campus. As a matter of fact, that's where I met my wife, over in uh, Murray Hall. And uh, the halls at that time <clears throat> had dance hours, certain nights of the week, and uh, and I, I met my I met, I met my wife there, my first and only wife. And uh, we met there, and we we spent a, a few hours on the fourth floor of the student union, also. Yeah. Well, I've heard something about submarine races around town. Were you familiar with that at all? No, not really. I heard about it. You heard about it too? Okay. Did you attend sporting events? Yes, I attended a, a few uh, sporting events and and I remember one of the biggest events was wrestling. And uh, I can remember uh, if you went to a, a wrestling match, you had to get there in the early to, to even to get in. It was a very crowded activity, I tell you. Were there any uh, particular games that you attended that stand out in particular for any of the sports? No, but some reason, for some reason, I remember coming up a, a semester one semester when I was still at Connors College, and I remember seeing my first major college basketball game in what is now Gallagher Iba Arena. And I remember it was a particular game where uh, Oklahoma A&M was playing Kansas. And I remember seeing a long, tall string bean of a young man playing ball for Kansas. Later on, I found out that his name was Will Chamberlain. Did you make it back home to Salisaw very often while you were in school? I went back occasionally. We would usually, I'd usually carpool with some, some other uh, students that were from that area of the country and we would carpool back and forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memories of the library? 
most of the memories I have of the library was that I would take my books over there and, and, and set them on the table and I might leave them there and while I was gone to the student union <laughs> for the floor. <laughs> Um, was there, were there any key events or developments at OSU that stand out in your memory while you were here? No, no, no key events, <clears throat> but I was impressed by the former president of this university, Mr. Oliver S. Wilhelm. I remember he was on campus uh, <clears throat> during those years, and uh, I just remember how friendly he was to us, to us students, no-name students, you know, as he'd come across campus, and uh, he'd spend time in the student union with us, just visiting. I just, I just remember that, and uh, mm -hmm. I think highly of Mm -hmm. um, how was it different being a, uh, working for OSU than being a student for OSU as far as the leadership or, or just uh, your sense of how things were, how things had changed? or <laughs> uh, I'm not for sure that... Uh... I'm not sure that I ever gave it any thought. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. What is it about Oklahoma State that sparks such loyalty in students and alumni? I guess the the friendships. I just I just wouldn't take for the friendships that I've made here, and just the it's just been so close to the people. I just really enjoyed my times that I've spent here on campus. How did attending OSU impact your life? Well, I guess it, uh, I guess it gave me some confidence. Growing up under very, very modest conditions in eastern Oklahoma, and the fact that I could come to school, and the fact that uh, I could make it through school, you know. Uh, at that time, it wasn't all that popular for students to go to college from my part of the country. And uh, I guess the confidence I gained mm -hmm. by coming. Did you experience it coming from Eastern Oklahoma here, and there weren't many students from that part of the state here, was there ever any um, time that you experienced or felt like um, people maybe kind of wondered about that part of the state or, or anything? Or maybe, I don't know. No, I don't, uh, I don't believe I did. We, we, we joked about it. And, did you? And, and might have talked about someone coming out of those woods over there in um. eastern Oklahoma, but I never did feel intimidated or insulted, really. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, uh, yeah. My son it kind of had the same experience when he, my older right? son, when he came here. Yeah, yeah. he did. Yeah. So there weren't many people, even you know, in '98 that were coming right from our hometown. So right. yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. interesting. Okay. I remember. Uh, well, no, we, we won't get off on it. <laughs> I remember the Spyro and some places. Oh before. yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, after you graduated from OSU and you went on and got your master's degree, uh, can you tell me briefly about your personal life and your, your career? Well, uh, I, I went into the extension service. I started out as assistant K-12 
county agent in Columbus, Kansas. And I went back to school for a graduate degree at Kansas State. And then I became the state pecan specialist for the extension service of Georgia, where Georgia is the number one producing pecan state in the nation. And during, uh, during those times, from Georgia I came to Texas, same position, and then I had the opportunity to come back home to Stillwater. During those times, I guess uh, a lot of my activity is that I, I did some rodeoing during those times. And what was your event? I, I, I usually hold two horses to, to contest off of. I usually hold a steer wrestling horse and a calf roping, tie down calf roping a horse. And, and I remember particularly when we were in Georgia, uh, that rodeo was becoming rather popular down there and in Florida. I was surprised when I got in to Florida and make rodeos down that area that fl Florida is also a big cow state. We think of it as a tourist place, but uh, down in those Palmettos, uh, there's a lot of cattle raised down there. And, and then later on, as I came back to Oklahoma State, I spent a lot of time playing the senior softball circuit, which I do to this day. And, uh, What's your position? I usually play the hot corners. I play third and first, and uh, we. Uh, we have a great time playing senior softball. I just got back from Georgia a few weeks ago. We played in a national tournament out there. We usually play across the retirement belt, uh, Arizona, get into California, uh, South Texas, and in the end of Florida playing senior softball tournaments. Senior softball tournaments start uh, usually at age 50, and then you graduate every five years into another age bracket. Mm -hmm. And uh, today I'm playing in the 70 to 75 age bracket. <laughs> Having a good time, as senior softballers are a lot like the little leaguers. We get all excited just like little leaguers do. And, and the sounds that come out of the stands when you're playing tournaments are a little different. When I was growing up, my children, or my daughter would my holler for daddy. Or my wife might holler for, for me. But today, the sounds that come out of the stands is, come on, Papa. Come on, Papa. And, uh, uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> is your team comprised of people from this area of Oklahoma? Yes, the uh, we play, uh, I played on the team that uh, in fact, I helped organize it in 93, and we selected players from across the state of Oklahoma. We might recruit across the border <clears throat> occasionally, one out of, one or two out of Arkansas, mm -hmm. according to the particular year. Mm -hmm. So you are ambassadors for Oklahoma for senior softball then? Yes. Yeah. And when we get to tournaments, they all know of us as Okies, <laughs> particularly in California and Arizona. Ah, does your team have a name? No, we were just simply the Oklahoma seniors. <laughs> and then as we graduated, we, we started out, we might be the Oklahoma senior 60s, and then we became the Oklahoma senior 65s. So. I bet that's a lot of fun. How have you remained connected to OSU? Well, I'm, uh, I'm continuing to be a Trying to, uh, <laughs> trying to, I guess one of the ways I stay connected is I work out at the Calvin Center two or three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a pretty good connection. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a member of the Alumni Association, both uh, OSU and Agriculture. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to OSU students today? Well, I'm 
not sure that I have any any particular advice that's uh, different than their mother and their daddy might tell them. <laughs> what would you uh, tell high school students who might be thinking about coming to OSU? Well, I'm, I'm partial. <laughs> I just think it's an enjoyable, homey atmosphere that's here on the campus. Mr. Taylor, you were telling me um, about your family, your heritage from Eastern Oklahoma. Yes, I was uh, born and raised in Eastern Oklahoma. Uh, I'm of Cherokee descent. Uh, my great grandmother has a little full blood Cherokee Indian girl, 12 years of age in, in 1837 and 1838 walked the Trail of Tears, as it became known because so many of our Cherokee ancestors uh, did not survive the trip. She walked from Southeast Tennessee to what is now Eastern Oklahoma. It was Indian Territory back then. My great-grandmother's name was Lizzie Groundhog. And she came to to be left at a camp east of Stillwell, Oklahoma, right on the Arkansas line. And she married a white man named Joe Taylor, who also came west with the Cherokees. And, and from that union, my grandpa John Taylor was born. Lizzie Groundhog died at a young age when Grandpa John Taylor was just a young lad. And an Indian named, uh, he, was, he, he was raised by an Indian named Caleb Starr. And Caleb Starr would have been related to Belle Starr's husband. And, and the Starrs were known as outlaws in eastern Oklahoma. And a lot of the outlaws would gather at Caleb Starr's house where my grandpa John was being raised. He tells the story that when the outlaws came, they would come maybe hide out or come by the house and spend the night that Caleb would remind them, says, y'all leave John long now, I'm going to raise him straight. Mm -hmm. And uh, Grandpa John grew up running some cattle in those hills in eastern Oklahoma. He married a, a young lady that bore him six children. She died in childbirth with the sixth child. He remarried and married a woman that bore him 12 children. So Grandpa John had 18 children two wives, 14 of them reached adulthood. My dad was of the, the last 12. And uh, so we go back to, uh, and we appreciate our Cherokee heritage. And I've spent some time in Southeast Tennessee and North Georgia trying to trace some of my ancestral footsteps and so uh, it's been it's been most interesting. Was it a part of your life growing up, as far as um, participation in any of the traditions? Um, yes, I grew up uh, as, as I've said. We grew up under very modest conditions. We had very few modern things. We did not have an automobile in the family. Dad raised us by farming with teams and horses. We had no electricity, no running water. We had a path and an outhouse. Uh, no telephone. And each year, twice a year, there would be what we call the Cherokee Stomp Dance. And I can remember the last time that I 
remember going to the stomp dance in a wagon. Went up into the hills where the, what was custom, where the Cherokees might dance all night around a fire. And those are some, some, some memories I have of, of growing up uh, around Cherokee influence in eastern Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And your family stories were passed down. Yes, they were. They were. They were passed down. Mm -hmm. Are they written? Not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, my older brother, who passed away this spring, was our family historian, and, and unfortunately, uh, we don't have enough written. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was it that influenced you to pursue higher education coming from the, the sparse background that you did? I would have to give some, some credit to 4-H uh, Club. I went to school in a little uh, two-room grade school up in the woods uh, between Salisaw and Vianne. We had a coal stove in each each little room, and the one thing we had, we had a very good 4-H club there. Our, our, we had a man and wife teacher those last years I spent there. Uh, they drilled us very well at 4-H club and in public speaking. And they instilled a lot of pride in us. And we had a very, very successful 4-H club. Uh, I, I, and then I got to go make trips to, one trips working through 4-H club. And as I said before, came to a Stillwater campus with 4-H club roundup, mm -hmm. gave presentations. And was the Roundup um, an event that you had to earn to be able to come here? At that time, you did. You had to win some event in the county, mm -hmm. whether it was a timely topic or demonstration or dress or school wear or some, some event. Mm -hmm. You more or less earned it. Mm -hmm. you know? And so your area was the public speaking? And I came and, and gave some, a presentation or two, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, just, uh, Did other of the young people that were in your 4-H group that had the same teachers, are they like you in, that, in what they've done with their lives in that way? As a matter of fact, there are. You know, when I get away from my Salisaw, I tried to spread on the dog a little bit, you know. And I might tell somebody that I was salutatorium of my eighth grade graduating class. And if my wife's around, she likes to play the part of the late Paul Harvey. She likes to tell the rest of the story that he was so famous for. She has to remind whoever I'm talking to, yes, he was salutatorium, there were three in the class and the two girls tied for valedictorian. But those two girls went on, went on to have very successful careers in education themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did you receive scholarships to start out at Connors? Uh, no, I did not. Uh, uh, I happened to have some wonderful siblings that helped me. They were all older than me, quite a bit older than me, and, and they helped me. And uh, uh, I can remember the, the, the tuition at Connors when I started. It was $38, take all you can stand. And that included all the fees that went with it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I got a job uh, working on the farm. And they gave me a place to sleep out there for first year and I did chores out on a college farm and paid for my room and board. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you work when you were going to school here? The only work I did here was 
take care of those chinchillas. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. it is. Do you have anything else about your family heritage that you'd like to include? No, I guess that uh, I guess that pretty well sums it up. Okay. Well, thank you for letting me um, ask you a few more questions for the interview today.